This morning I want to talk to you about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it is called humility. It's one of those, I think, more quieter gifts that, that God gives to us. Um, and the thing is, you think of someone that you would see as humble, and you can recognize it, don't you think, pretty quickly when someone's being humble. And the flip side is, you can pretty much lose it the minute you try to claim that gift and say, I'm, I'm being humble, because the minute you try to identify it yourself, you sort of lose it, right? And you just, you're not being humble for some reason. Like uh, Linus from the Peanuts cartoon strip, one day he's musing to himself and telling Charlie how one day when he grows up, he wants to be a humble little country doctor. And he's telling Charlie, he said, yep, what I'm going to do is every morning get up and get into my sports car and drive out to the country where I will heal people, heal everyone far and wide, and I'll be known as a humble little country doctor. Right? So you, you see, you, you just lose sight of it the minute you try to tell others how humble you are. Well, humility is in our conversation in this hope, uh, Unshakable Hope series because it is actually tied to one of God's promises in Scripture. The Isaiah passage said this, that the God who dwells up in the high and the almighty places also dwells down low with the humble and the contrite, dwelling with us to revive our spirits. James 4 puts it this way, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That's the promise. Humility, it seems, is our gateway. It's, it's the open door to, to receiving God's grace and God's mercy. I think the first gift that humility gives us is really an accurate view of ourselves. And now I'm saying accurate, okay? Um, you know, when we look at our accomplishments or our successes or our importance or how smart we are or how beautiful we are, handsome we are, the flip side when we look at our failures or when we see our faults or our weaknesses or our pride, Humility is what helps us not think too great of ourselves, but also not think too little of ourselves because of that. There's an old comedian by the name, comedian by the name of Phyllis Diller. She used to say it this way, you know what keeps me humble? Mirrors. Yeah, you know, an accurate view of yourself is how we find humility. C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian writer, he said this, he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself less. I say that again, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself a little bit less often. All right, that's where humility lands. Now, when we take that honest view of ourselves, one of the things we're going to discover, and this is our Christian perspective, is that our nature is to resist God. That we are always wanting to go it on our own. We, we think we've got a better way to do it, and we prefer our independence from God. The reality of that view is we were made by God. And we were made to be in a relationship with God, and really in a relationship with one another. That's just in our makeup. And yet there's this other part of us that's always seeking independence. Humility, I had to look this up, it, it's a Latin derivative of the word hummus in Latin. Hummus, which means earth. Well, you know these stories. To be humble is to remember God made us out of this earth. And as the scripture says, from earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We come into this world having absolutely nothing, completely dependent, and we leave this world with absolutely nothing, completely dependent on God's grace, right? Humble, humble. Now, it doesn't mean being independent is a bad thing. 
In fact, when we're raising our children, we're teaching them independence, and that's good. My friend, uh, she would remind me when her little girl was two years old, she just complained, she says, all I hear is, I can do it, mommy, I can do it, mommy, I can do it, mommy, and she'd be proud of herself, say, look what I did, mommy, and we want that in our children to develop some independence and be proud of the things that they're doing. But what a great caring conversation to have as parents with your children about the balance between being humble about your accomplishments and also um, being proud of yourself. The flip side for most of us, we're, we're just learning dependence, always to go back and rely on God and learn how to rely on each other. My friend Jan, she was learning that path of dependence uh, when her husband was sick and again when she was widowed. Some of you are probably familiar with this journey or have friends who have had to walk down this path. For Jan, while her husband was sick, it was the caregiving became more demanding. She had to learn how to rely on those around her. She said, well, I had to learn to swallow my pride. But then she discovered there were no calories in that, so maybe that was okay to do. <laughs> she learned to call on friends to come and help her do the housework that her husband had been doing and to come and help her adapt her home so it was more accessible and easier for her husband to navigate around the house. She learned to ask for rides and for people to care for their dog and to take care of some meals and to do all these things. And when her husband passed, she discovered her need for others didn't let up. She wanted to stay in her home. And those friends, she needed them to come and help her fix things that she didn't know how to handle and to take care of some things. And she learned that she wanted to travel, but she'd have to ask someone to go travel with her to all these adventurous places in the world. And so she did. And she invited people to go to concerts with her and out to meals and lunch. And she realized her life was richer when she learned to depend on other people. Her secret, though, was this. She said, I never asked the same couple of people over and over. I just asked a lot of different people to do just a little bit of stuff for me, and then I spread it around. That worked great. Well, here's the good news. God knows our rebelliousness and never tires of us turning back and asking for his love and for his forgiveness. It's us who grow tired of asking for forgiveness, but not God. He loves to hear from you and to hear what you have to say. And the humble person remembers again and again that my life with God is going to be far better than me trying to figure this out all by myself. That I need God's grace and God's mercy. And I need God's instruction and his correction in my life and I need his help. Well, this humility thing, we're not alone. And in the Bible, Jesus' disciples struggled with this too. There's some great examples of how their pride kind of began to swell. One was, can you believe this? It was like they're walking down the road arguing about who's the greatest among them. It, it, it sounds like being out on the golf course, you know? It's just like, who's the better shot? Who did best? It, it's just this conversation, and they're arguing for it. Well, Jesus hears it, and he stops, and he says, guess what, guys? If you want to be the greatest, this is how you do it. You should be last of all and servant of all. That's the path to greatness. The Apostle Paul would pick up on this theme when he writes in Philippians. He said, let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be important, but for him it was taking the form of a human, being humble, and becoming a servant. For Paul, it wasn't that Jesus emptied himself and gave up his identity as God. No, he took on even more and said it was even more important for me to become a servant so that we would learn what a servant is. This is modeling a servanthood mentality. It doesn't mean you give up 
and you, you quit on all your abilities and your talents. No, you hold on to what is strong and good and, and admirable about you, but you also assume these roles of humility, of service to others. That's how we follow Jesus. So if humility becomes our, our gateway to discovering, experiencing God's grace and mercy, and getting a good view of who you are. These are the things I hope you'll, you'll see. The first, I love the band saying what for me is an identity question. I am redeemed. See that that's who you are. You're forgiven. You are redeemed. You are not in your brokenness. You are completely forgiven and covered. And God's grace will always be there to answer that. You're redeemed. And the other way to see yourself is as blessed. You are richly, richly blessed. We heard the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she gets the news she's going to have this baby Jesus as a teenage, unwed mother, right? Difficult life. Uh, but for her, she began to say, well, God has blessed me and wants to use me in this way. I am honored to be his servant. Everyone will call me blessed because of this role. And each time we, we hear and sing this Magnificat, it's, it's calling us to say, this is how God treats. He lifts up and will use absolutely anyone and everyone and bless their life. And he'll remind the pride and the, the proud and the mighty that maybe they got to get off their high horse a little bit. That's what that story's about. Way back when, there was a communication system called the Morse Code. Ever heard of it? <laughs> Samuel Morris is supposedly um, just this great inventor who was quite humble. And how do we know this? Uh, sometimes he'd be asked questions. As you were inventing that, did you ever, you know, just have your doubts and hit some roadblocks? What did, how did you handle that? And he said, I would pray. I would pray that God would give me understanding. And once he invented this, he said, wow, you've got to be really proud of yourself. And he put it this way, ever so humbly, he said, I have made a valuable application of electricity, not because I was superior to others, but solely because God, who meant it for humankind, must reveal it to someone and was pleased to reveal it to me. Wow, that's humble, isn't it? That's like Mary saying, I just got chosen. God used me, and I'm pleased to bring this to the world. If that was God's will and God's desire. There's a current author named Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote a book called Outliers, who began to say, all of us are blessed. We don't even recognize it in our successes and in our accomplishments that maybe there was more going on than just me doing all of this. That maybe timing and location had a lot to do with it. For example, some of his examples are this. You know who Bill Gates is, right? He went on to look at his marvelous accomplishments in computers. He said, well, guess what? He just happened to be born into an affluent family and living right next to a university that gave him access and practice with computers. If he didn't have all of that, that blessing in his life, you know, maybe he wouldn't have gotten that far. Another one he said, he looked at hockey players, you know, these athletes and how they're gifted as, as young athletes. And I bet you know this. He recognized those who were a little bit older, born in September, did a lot better than those who were born in June and came to the hockey team. They're more developmentally, physically, and mentally to do better. And he said, it's just timing. It's just all about timing. I share these stories with you as, as examples to remind you, you are blessed that God is putting people in your life and timing things and putting you in places so that these blessings come into your life and you see them, and see clearly the humility of who you are. So, how do we continue this walk humbly with God? How do we keep that up? Well, 
I honestly think God puts people in our lives to keep us humble. <laughs> and he puts them really close to us so that he sees, you know, our imperfections as well as our giftedness. That they love us, but frankly, they're not in awe of us. You know who the people I'm talking about. They're probably sitting with you right now today. <laughs> It's that old saying, behind every successful man is a surprised woman. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's one way of putting that. Yeah, they're the ones that are going to tell you, you need a Kleenex. You got a spot on your shirt, honey, maybe you should go change. You know, they, they see all these little imperfections, and that's okay. They also love you and become your biggest encouragers. If you have uh, jumped into a small group uh, during this fall series and, and tried that, just bless you. I hope uh, now that you've been meeting for a few weeks, you're kind of rubbing shoulders and getting to know each other and uh, maybe irritating each other a little bit. That's all good. That's how relationships should be working. But you're also enjoying that time and growing in relationships and walking humbly together. I think God gives us that. Finally, Got any country music fans here? You know Tim McGraw? 2016, he came out with a hit single called Always Stay Humble and Kind. Maybe you didn't know about uh, behind this song was actually a woman that wrote the lyrics. Her name is Lori McKenna. One day she was thinking about what she and her husband as parents wanted their kids to know, and uh, I think she was having trouble communicating that to them, that they weren't listening, so she decided, I'm just going to write this down, and maybe one day they'll read this for me. And it's really written like a bedtime prayer that you might say to your child at the end of the day when you want to bless them, and here's some of the lyrics. Hold the door. Say please. Say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. And when the dreams you're dreaming come to you, and when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride. Always stay humble and kind. Friends, I think that's Jesus' hope for us as his children, that we would hear this promise from him, that he will dwell with the humble, he will lift us up.